All right, Miami fans, I'm sure your calendars have been circled for quite some time. Now you can actually attach a specific time for kickoff. So you can plan the entire day around that September 4th weekend opener against the Alabama Crimson Tide in Atlanta. This is, of course, our Hurricanes live show, the 148th edition. Cam Underwood right here from State of the U to answer your questions and comments. And I will fill in where I uh, deem appropriate as well. Cam, how are we doing tonight? Uh, doing well. Feel good. Uh, good day at the secret day job, you know, so uh, I feel good because of that. Always a great day to be a Miami Hurricane, so I feel great because of that. And, uh, you know, it's good to be back with you guys. Only a couple of days since the last time that we were convened together. So uh, it's great and great and great for me. How about you? It's going well. It's going well. Had a uh, nice little day myself. Uh, it's been... Um, Rather, rather warm here for this time of year. It's uh, broken 80 the last few days, and it's bright and sunny. So that's my kind of weather. Finally, we're here. It's It's been nice for about six weeks. I can't complain. Nice. But more, in the, more in the 65 to 70 range. You know, this is the first couple of days where it felt like summer. Summer weather yeah. with uh, Memorial Day coming on. So, folks, you guys know the deal. You leave your comments and your questions in the live chat, and you basically produce the show. But we're going to start off with this uh, game time that was announced earlier today. Alabama and Miami get together not just on September 4th, but it's a 3.30 Eastern time window, which is a very familiar one to college football fans. That 3.30 window has been a set time for, for pretty big games for a long, long time, according to the networks, because, of course, uh, the first uh, wave starts at noon each and every Saturday. So 3.30 is that next uh, television window. So any thoughts about 3.30? Does it work for you? Yeah, it works for me. Obviously, I think that you hold out uh, hope, at least that you're going to get the 8 o'clock primetime slot that went to Georgia uh, Clemson uh, for that same day, uh, the September the 4th. So, I mean, you want your marquee games to be in marquee time slots. But, again, I think that the fact that it's Miami and Alabama and – even more so Alabama at this current point of where we are in the history of life, uh, you know, makes that a big game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you would have liked it to see um, just for a prestige standpoint, that eight o'clock game. Uh, but I understand where, you know, ABC is going with or ABC, ESPN, the, you know, conglomerate that they are, uh, the Disney corporation, whatever uh, variation or, or portion thereof decided to go with Clemson, Georgia instead at the eight o'clock. But, you know, um, I think 3.30 fits. It's a definitely it's a spotlight time, obviously, for, uh, you know, the last little bit with the SEC on CBS. It's been that 3.30 time slot has been their feature game of the week. So that goes into the afternoon, into the beginning of prime time, because that game, you know, three and a half, four hours is going to finish in that between 7.15 to 8.20, give or take, uh, time frame. So you're going to touch the top end of, of prime time. Uh, and it's a destination kind of a time frame. It's a destination game. Um, and it's two iconic brands. Hopefully, you know, we have Miami bringing their half to the uh, to the table for that game. Uh, but 3.30, I think it's good. And it's more positive than having a nooner. And I don't think that they would ever put that game as a nooner. But just to have it actually concretely this is a, you know, one of the three thirty eight o'clock time slots and get one of those. I think it's a positive. Yeah. Clemson and Georgia. I don't know how many matchups in non-conference play would knock that one out of prime time. That's uh that's a game that I'm looking at right now in terms of just sheer talent on the field. And I don't know that there's going to be a game played at least in the regular season, of course, that's going to match the talent of those two football teams on one field. Yeah, uh, I mean, I know Georgia's secondary has seen some defections, obviously Tyreek Stevenson being in Miami being one of them, uh, and I think there was another one today or yesterday or something like that. So um, it's not as – they're not as talented as they were before some of these guys left. But, yeah, I agree. That's going to be among the most talented games that you can watch. Um, I would say even more talented than Miami-Alabama because both teams have more talent than Miami. Uh, even though they don't have as much talent as Alabama. So, um, yeah, I mean, but the, the connection of the two of them at that high level uh, would make it uh, even more so. But, yeah, I mean, it's still being talked about in that kind of a space is great. This is what Miami wants. Uh, this is, you know, where we want to be. This is who we want to be and beat. 
Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, having this matchup and having it as a, a showtime, uh, you know, a, a very solid time slot, that 3.30 SEC big game time slot um, is a positive for Miami. Although, to be honest, you would have preferred the 8 o'clock. But I understand why we didn't get that for that night. Florida State fan, Phil, we see your comment. I have posted it here. I am going to spin this comment into a more legitimate comment this way. Okay, there's one commit. I don't think this is a big issue. I don't think it's a big concern. Miami's been recruiting well under Manny Diaz. They're in play for tons and tons of uh, four and five stars, uh, in particular, tons of four stars. I will ask this, though. When does that become a concern? Because I'm looking at commitment ah, lists. Well, you're you're the recruiting guy, but no. I I do look at a lot of recruiting just in terms of numbers, um, in, in terms of getting in context. I can't right. scout people, and I don't get into the 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 granular, but I do look at commitment lists like almost every day, and I do notice that most of the major schools are more in that four to six range of commitments right now. Yeah, um, this has been actually a question um, that. I wouldn't say fractures the Miami fan base, but there's definitely two different thoughts on it. Um, and Phil's comment, if you're podcasting this or whatever later, is that Miami is 73rd in the country right now with only one commit and UCF is higher um, than uh, than them. Uh, Phil, and also, I get, okay, Travis Hunter is a monster. He grew up as a Florida State fan. I think it would be a stupid, stupid decision for him to go there, which I said you know a month ago or whatever. If you believe about silent commits, then I got a I got a bridge in Mississauga, Montana, to sell you, bro. Because silent commits, more often than not, don't end up going where they were silently committed. Because if they were going to go there, they would be publicly publicly committed. Um, there's a wide receiver who ended up at Georgia, who I know for a fact gave three different schools, including Miami, a silent commitment. Um, there's been plenty of other guys who were silent commitments, uh, to various places, including Miami, including Florida state, including insert team here. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to push back on Travis Hunter's committed Santino Marchiol and whoever else is committed. Fine. Cool. That is true. But if you're banking everything on silent commits, then you're banking in, in lies, fairy tales and fantasies pretty much. Um, back to the question at hand, when does the fact that Miami only has one commit become an issue? It's not right now, but it's relatively so for me. Um, some people are saying, you know, like, Hey, just trust the process of recruiting, see what happens at the end. You know, and a lot of people check out in on recruiting because it's, all the time is 365. You know, these kids go places, they say things, you know, they they play these camps, they do these interviews, they do all this stuff, they do the virtual, all these kind of different things. So some people would say, I don't want to be in it the week to week. I want to check in towards the end. I'll read the recaps, the, you know, the recruiting notebooks or whatever it is, and I'll get to know the new players who are coming onto my favorite team. There's also those of us who follow it all the time. So, Phil, seven in a row is not right now. We had a sixth streak before that. You know what I mean? Like, th that's not current. And if you're talking about Miami fans living in the past, fine. Live in the present. What have you done recently? You've lost to Miami four years in a row with four different quarterbacks, including by six touchdowns this last year. And that could have been a – that was the biggest step, the margin of defeat that y'all have ever suffered in our hands and was pretty much a name that score, uh, you know, night for us. So that's fine. You can look into the past and everything, but then, you know, it's going to come down to the fact that we've beaten you more than you've beaten us. We've kept you from championships while winning more championships than you. So, you know, like you can go back and say the seven in a row, but we can keep going and extend that. You know what I mean? Or we can live right now, you know, because you want to live in the then during that seven. We're living in the four right now. That's going to become five, going to become six, going to become you know what I mean? So we can have it either way. Anyways, let me focus. No shiny objects. 
um, as someone at uh, the Secret Day Job says. Shiny objects. And I'm like, no, I'm focused on this. Anyway, I'm focused on this answer. Miami needs to see positive moving movement on the recruiting trail. I believe sooner than later, because if you on, if you go into the late summer with only one commitment, then that becomes a hill that you have to climb. You know, a, a, a circumstance you have to overcome for whatever reason. Even if it's you have good reasons or whatever, you only have one commit right now. You know what I mean? Like nobody else wants to. You don't have that. Duke John, okay, maybe it's not even Duke Johnson because he was a five star. You don't have that diehard kid who's a high three or four star from home, and you push for him for a commitment. You can't even get that. You can't even get a couple of those. But you want me to hop in the boat, and you only got one guy who, you know, it could become this thing. So, do I think that it's like a real existential crisis at this moment? No, I don't. I would like to see. As things open up in a couple weeks, right? So when we got the junior cookout on June 1st, you got the senior cookout on June 2nd, you got official visits starting the weekend of June 4th, you got other visits and things like that. I want to see positive movement. I want to see some commitments. I want to hear some chatter. I want to see those things happen for the University of Miami so that by the 4th of July weekend, so if we're calling that four full weeks from when things open up, I would like to see five commitments. Me. That's one a week for the four weeks of June, closing on a couple of guys. You're going to have a bunch of guys on campus for visits because they're starting to take these visits in June before they early enroll. So everybody's not waiting to the end of the process anymore, right? So one a week in terms of talent acquisition, in terms of what the rumors have been, what the chatter has been, what the GIF usage, and it's GIF, not GIF, miss me with that the gift usage by the coaching staff yeah it's it's graphic good yes. good, good good not graphic you know what i mean anyway um even though there is a giraffe but whatever graphic uh um thing so yeah the gifts they the, the staff seems to be hype behind the scenes of recruiting right so let's get some of that let's get these commitments and let's get this thing rolling Right, where we have more than one. So I don't think it is a far-fetched idea to say, again, one per week average over the course of June to go into the 4th of July weekend, week time, with five commitments or more in this class. Now, for me, if it gets towards fall camp in the middle end of August, around or after my birthday, the international holiday known as August 17th, the most awesome day in the history of the world. Um, we get around my birthday... And we got one or two commits, and you got camp coming up the next week, and you're three weeks out from Alabama. Again, still not an existential crisis, but a time and a circumstance that you really got to focus on. You really got to now have that conversation. So I think the time horizon still exists where Miami can move positively. There's still time to get guys going and get this momentum. You've already had a whiff. With Isaiah Bond, you know, you've already had some things change and reshuffle on the cycle and on the the target list, but there's still enough time to move forward in a positive way. But for me, I would like to see that happening sooner than later. Yeah, because you figure if uh, a lot of these guys have all sorts of lists of four and five and seven and nine but I got to think that most of them are really looking at three to four schools. Of course, we're talking about hundreds of players, so there's all sorts of different mindsets and timelines. But a, a, a large portion of these guys, uh, once we hit that first weekend, like you say, the first weekend in June, uh, the big schools are going to be having their special weekends and their visitations and all that. And a lot of these guys, all they really need to see uh, is the one that they really, really want. They just want to get on campus and see it, and they'll be ready to. So we'll see those commitments roll in, you know, week two of June and so forth. But I would think really as you target late June into July when a lot of these student athletes have been able to visit maybe three places, four places, those final three or four that they really wanted to see, then we'll see them start to roll in, in sometime in July. 
Yeah, um, that's that's what I'm looking for. And I mean, again, I think that the timeline makes sense because getting everything, just changing the whole story right up front, um, I don't think that that is um, reasonable or possible. It's going to take more time. To the question that is still up there, what do I think of a Miami cornerback class this year of Kamari Rogers? I'd look up his first name. Um, Allen. What's his first name? Um, Jacoby Spells is the third one. Uh, the Chris Graves kid. And I forget which Allen they're asking about. Mm-hmm. I forget his first name. Um, maybe they meant Alfonso. I, I don't know if they meant Alfonso Allen from Hallandale who's committed to Arizona State or not. But <laughs> that's a... That's a ridiculous class. That's a home run class. That's a grand slam class. That at cornerback is the kind of recruiting that Miami's not had in forever with a five star and Kamari Rogers, uh, Rogers, uh, Jacoby Spells from American Heritage, who was a wide receiver turned defensive back. Uh, he's a borderline four star guy. I know that you guys are going to hate on the name. I know it. Because he didn't necessarily always live up to this. But Tracy Howard was a wide receiver turned cornerback. Had a 1,000 yards in JV his freshman year opposite of Malcolm of uh, Malcolm Lewis. Then the coach went to him and said, hey, uh, you have the skill set to play corner. You can work opposite your best friend instead of on the same – opposite on the, the field as in defense versus offense instead of, uh, you know, field and boundary side. And, you know, really make something. And he was the number one corner in a five-star in the class. You have Jacoby Spells, who could, I don't know he could be the number one corner in this class, but Jacoby Spells, who also is a track star, uh, has athleticism to play here. Chris Graves, another track star, same high school as Malik Curtis, same team as Malik Curtis, but two or three inches taller. He's that 6'1", 6'2", with electric speed. Those four guys in this class at cornerback, you would be hard pressed to find a reasonable scenario of what the rest of the class would need to be for me not to take that. You know what I mean? It would take the, Oh, the sky fell and this, this. So you get these four guys, but the dregs of the earth and the little sisters of the poor are the rest of your recruiting class. It would have to take something like that. But with a Miami caliber class, including those four guys, Sign me up right now on May the 18th, 2021 for December, whatever. Give me those four guys with an, uh, within, within a Miami caliber class with the requisite four and five star blue chip talent and the projectable three stars that, you know, we will get. Sign me up. I've been calling him Falcon ERX forever because I've never spoken to him directly, but he's been a great supporter of the channel and this show in particular, but really all the shows. And uh, actually, Falcon Er X Falconer, I believe it was. Uh, I actually, I actually called the show last night, and so I talked uh, directly to. So we we appreciate that, and it was great conversation and uh, great support out of him. Thank you so much for the super sticker. Appreciate that. Uh, the war wages on with uh, the 2013 uh, Florida State Seminoles. All right. Cam gets his first uh, goat call of the night. There it is. Good to see everybody in here. All right. I will serve this one up. I would rather go to a, ah, shoot, this sometimes runs away from me. I just... Locked in on a question, and then it scrolled forever. Roland, who is the offensive and defensive can't miss prospects for Miami. It's funny. The year that I wrote the recruiting rules, I also wrote a standalone piece about can't miss prospects because I don't believe that they exist because there's always another quarterback there's always another six five receiver there's always another defensive back there's always another linebacker the fact of the fact of it is excuse me that you cannot just keep missing on all of them into perpetuity um instead of saying who's a can't miss i will say 
I'll give you a couple of my favorites. How about that? Um, we already have a quarterback. In terms of, I don't even know that we're going to take a running back. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that we're going to take a running back. I do like the uh, Anthony Hankerson kid from St. Thomas Aquinas. I don't necessarily know that he's a Miami player, um, but he's a kid that I like. I will say that. Um, at um, – geez, I'm just going down this these lists. Um, from – at tight end – there's the kid from Nebraska. Big yikes. That's my boy Phil Jones from Atlanta, who I talked about last Thursday. He's probably calling me about my play nephew. I give him a call later. Anyway, um, the kid from Nebraska. Well, there's Micah Riley Dick, yeah, Riley Ducker from was uh Washington. No, sorry. Yeah, that's him from Nebraska. Caden Helms also from Nebraska. And there's a kid from Washington State, I thought. Um, but those are some guys at tight end that I like. Definitely the Helms kid. Um, I would love it. It's not going to happen. But I would love it if, like, a Zach Rice, number five overall, number one offensive tackle, um, if he were to come on down. Um, obviously, Julian Armella, uh, who's back at St. Thomas Aquinas, I believe. Um from the local area, he's a you know four star, borderline five star, uh, offensive tackle. And then you know I've talked about them a lot, but you have all these defensive ends down here this year: Shamar Stewart, Kenyatta Jackson Jr., um, Marvin Jones Jr., uh, the Dante Andersons of the world, the uh, the Dillard kid who just committed from uh, decommitted from Florida State. Lord Jesus, Nigel e. Kelly, uh, Kelly's of the world. You know, so there's a lot of them. So I don't necessarily think that there's a must get can't miss on him guy. Because, for example, if you miss on Armella, hopefully you're going to get a four star, five star, well, probably a four star tackle from somewhere else. If you miss on Shamar Stewart, who's a borderline top three, you know, in the conversation for number one overall recruit, sure, you want to have that electric kind of potential on your roster, but maybe you get a Nigel Lee Kelly, Dante Anderson, and, you know, Kenyatta or Marvin, you know, instead, is it a one-to-one -one replacement? No, but is it a replacement with a player of Miami caliber who's very damn good? Absolutely. So for me, that's where I look on. If you miss on an individual, do you get another guy who's of high caliber to replace him? Or are you then scraping the bottom of the barrel, getting, you know, guys who otherwise might be group of five or FCS or division two kids and trying to slot them in instead? Because if you have a six foot, 185 pound defensive end, and you're saying, okay, he's going to be the guy I'm going to slot into that scholarship slot instead of any of those top five defensive ends that I mentioned from South Florida, that's not a peer level par replacement, right? So you want to have somebody that's of that same ilk, even if it's not necessarily the one to one singular kind of uh, skill set. So for me, again, I don't think that there's a can't miss person, but you have to do your, enough, whether it's local, national, whatever, to recruit and get the talent that you need, even if the name of the player is different than the number one player that you might prefer at that position, if that makes sense. Daryl Page has a question here that you're certainly going to have to take on because I'm not understanding the relevance of it based on his current weight dimensions versus the position and all that. So if, mm -hmm. if you can make anything out of it, go to it. Okay, so the question is about James Williams. James Williams, five-star recruit, number one safety in America, 6'5", 220. Plays safety. Massive. Massive, massive. Um, lots of people thought that he was going to outgrow safety at the high school level. Said that, you know, hey, he's going to be an outside backer, whatever, whatever. And James, you know, searches his name on Twitter and will quote tweet it and say, nah, I'm a safety. And we're like, yeah, I don't know, you're, you know, 6'4", 190 pounds as a 10th grader. You know, grew an inch and, grew, and gained 30 pounds, you know, well, 25, 30 pounds between 10th and 12th grade, but well, still played safety, played damn well. So he's profiling right now to stay there. You know, and maybe, yeah, he can come down in the box. He has this incredible physicality. He's abnormally sized for someone of that position. 
but the question is how long until he's 225 to 235? He's a cheeseburger away from 225. You know what I mean? Like, literally, like a cheeseburger, a nice big one from the tub or something, like from 225. He's a couple protein shakes and a bunch of squats from 230. I think it's more about, one, his desire, and two, his overall physicality. Because somebody who's that big, you know, your bone structure is going to wake. So, like, him being 230 isn't changing too much. You know what I mean? If his body composition completely changes, then maybe. But James Williams is good enough at safety for us to run that out there and say, until you prove that you can't hack it by your performance and or you just completely outgrow this. Since people are talking, since these Florida State morons continue talking, I'm going to use somebody from Florida State as an example of someone who outgrew their position and it was mandated because of their changed physicality that they changed position. I have one seminal name, and there's been pieces written about this person. Mark, do you know the name I'm thinking? Do I know the name? The name I'm thinking of someone who went to Florida State at one position in one size, for whatever reason, became this completely other size, and then changed his position because of that. That's a great question. It's like uh, the one best example you can have. Offense or defense? Offense. Hmm. <laughs> Shoot, I'm I'm not coming up with it, and I know I'll kick myself when I. He was. Yeah, it was written in 2013. You should look it up. The Legend of Dan Kendra. Oh, Dan Kendra. Yeah, that's Dan right. Kendra, who came in as a blue chip quarterback and blew his knee out. Yeah. And in his rehab from his torn knee, gained 70 pounds of muscle and turned into a fullback. If you saw Dan Kendra, go look it up. It was written on SB Nation February of 2013. The Legend of Dan Kendra. He's 6'2", 190. He ended up 6'2", like 255, 260 almost of muscle because he just got in the weight room when he couldn't walk and started lifting and then with his rehab and kept lifting and went from this stick to this dude. And that was what precipitated the change. He couldn't go back to be quarterback anymore. And they moved on. They had other players and everything like that. If you undergo that kind of physical change with James Williams, right, if he – I don't think that the barrier for James Williams to move to linebacker is 235 because I think that he can wear 235 because he's 6'5", almost 6'6", and still look like a safety. I think that he's going to have to be – he would have to be a 245, 250-year up guy pretty much to really have his body change that much to then say, let's walk him down. And, again, James Williams is good enough at the position of safety, at this uncommon size where Miami is best served to at least try him there. Plus the fact you also have the transfer portal. And if you do to him what Florida State did to Anquan Bolden, which is have him have two snaps at quarterback when he first got there and say, hey, we need somebody in the receiver line. Would you just pop over there for a little bit? Never to be seen a quarterback again, right? Stayed there, did that, was a great player, NFL, did it, all that stuff. You try to do something like that to James Williams, he's gone. You know, a couple reps with T-Rob and the safeties and everything. Hey, man, you know, like Al Golden did that one day or two days in practice that one time. Hey, David Njoku, let's take the number 86 off you. Let's give you number 50 and put you in linebacker. That was a two-day experiment, and that ended. If you did something again like that with James Williams, he's going to be out of here. So his he's uncommonly sized. He's uncommonly greatly talented for someone of that size of safety and can still probably gain 15 or 20 pounds and not lose that much athleticism. So for me, 235, 240, you're still going to have them there. Two, if, uh, 240 gets to be maybe the conversation point for me, but it's going to take a lot to really move him down. And even though he's gotten bigger, both 
bulk wise and height wise, he still was the number one core, uh, safety recruit in America. So, is it possible that down the line, James Williams becomes a linebacker? Yes, of course. I'm not going to say it's impossible. It's possible. I think it is at present more far fetched than certainty that some people think. But that's me. Joe Zucci, no. Next question. The uh, Florida State Miami, which of course this is a Miami live stream, so I'll just uh, isolate on Florida State. The Florida State Venom is uh, is at a higher than usual pitch tonight for some reason. You know, it's it's the thing where hit dogs holler. You know, if they're on the bottom and we you know hit them and ran over them and you know turned them into roadkill year after year after year, they're going to be hollering. You know, it's you know they are right now. At one time, they were the big dogs, and they would show up, and they would bark, and everybody else would go scurrying. Right now, you're like my mom's Pomeranian. Eight pounds, most of it fur, yap, 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 but no bite to it. And when that big Doberman turns around, which happened one time when I was walking my mother's dog, going up the stairs to a different building, over by my townhouse. That dog stopped on the stairs when the owner was walking it up. Oof! One good time. That dog would not go outside to use the bathroom anymore. I'd get pee pads and everything. Because he's like, ah, I remember that big dog. And I thought I was yapping. And that big dog yapped. And I'm good off of it. Florida State, y'all used to be that doberman. Now you're the Pomeranian. Sorry, bro. Yeah, it's uh, gotten to a place with that uh, that seminal football program. It's uh, been ugly, ugly, ugly now for quite a long time. Uh, I don't know that I would have ever guessed I would have seen Florida State football look like fill in the blank Duke, Syracuse type football. For more than a year now, it's been three years, and each year's gotten worse. Yeah. All right. Yes, this is all anybody wants to talk about is uh, Florida State and Miami, back and forth, tit for tat, back and forth, back and forth, and of course, uh, as Cam pointed out, <laughs> as Cam pointed out, um, you know, if you're going to go at this uh, argument, uh, program versus program, you, you, you can't get too creative with your time parameters. You're either going to argue, are we going to argue all time? Are we going to argue today? You know, this kind of picking time periods, unless both parties can agree on that time period and say, hey, let's look at the last 20 years. You know, obviously, and I say this as a, neutral bystander, the Florida State fan's going to say, well, Miami's got to go all the way back to 2001. We don't need to go all the way back to 2001 if they're talking about national championships. You can take and this. Again, notice how they're, they're like that seven that seven run, right? Yeah. That came, okay, we went back and forth a couple of years before that, but then right before those couple back and forths, we were waxing that ass. So like you're talking about, it's very selective to be like, yeah, to right here, Ignore that, ignore that. But to right here, like, come on. Come and on. when does 2013 become a long time ago? It depends it's on your perspective. Long, it's already a long time ago. If we're being perfectly honest. And that's not even saying that we have one that's more recent. I'm just saying the one that you are putting up as, you know, having just happened. Did it just happen? Or was that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. What, yeah. What, in the eye of the beholder, I guess, when you say 2013, is is that recent? Is it not? Well, if, if they were still chugging along at 10 and 2 every year, but just had not won a national championship to, since 2013, that 2013 to me in context is a little more reputable than 2013 and then the last three years just completely off the cliff. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, if the last three years were, 
nine and three, eight and four, eight and four for them. That 2013 feels much closer in the rearview mirror than it is now. Because, yeah, I mean, remembering that light years is a measure of distance, not time. Whew, man, it is the distance between where the program is now and where it was then. Light years and light years and light years of distance between them. Yeah. I hate to bring up this program, but I think you get the point. Uh, Ohio State won one year later in 14. Mm -hmm. It's the same program. Right, but that program has been to the playoff multiple times, has been to the championship game. You know what I mean? Like, it's, you know, for them, closer than Florida State because you think, oh, yeah, that's, you know, in consecutive years or whatever. Very, very different, very different, very different, very different. Matt is going with Miami. It's the better program right now. Better program all time. Yeah, we're we're gonna have to uh, get into uh, some some current topics. So here we go. Uh, I don't know what this is really worth, but we're gonna go to it. Athlons came out with the top five. This would be the top five newcomers to the Miami football team in twenty twenty one. Their top five. Can I give you mine before and see if they? Yes, answer? absolutely. All right. Am I including transfers or no? Yes. Newcomers to the program. Charleston Rambo, Tyreek Stevenson. I don't think it's close there, by the way. Um, in terms of impact on the field, uh, Andres Borgales, because he's going to be the kicker, uh, taking over for his brother. DeAndre Johnson is in the conversation for me, but I think that that's safe. Uh, the defensive end. Uh, and I think it's maybe more of a conversation than Rambo and uh, and Stevenson. So I'm actually going to leave him off. So I'm going to say um, for this year, Cameron Kinchins at safety. And Malik Curtis, because I think he's going to be our special team for Turner. So, again, that's Rambo, Stevenson, Borgales, Curtis, and uh, and Kinchins. Those are my top five for their impact on the field as newcomers newcomers this year. What did that find out? Here's their list of five, which I don't understand because, as I mentioned to Cam before we started to go, uh, started to record, that uh, I've been using this. Uh, for a number of teams, and I think it's it's based on the writers, the individual, even though they're all coming from Athlons, I think it's the individual writer's interpretation because uh, most of them have included early enrollees, uh, later enrollees, uh, if they thought that they would have an impact. So this particular writer left off the two five stars. They went with and, Tyreek Stevenson. And yep. for, for the record, so did I. You Just, did. I did. Uh, and so I'm going to read off these top five, and then I'm going to pose a player that I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is ultra important for a particular reason. Okay, Tyreek Stevenson, Charleston Rambo, DeAndre Johnson, Elisha Arroyo, and Cameron Kinchins. That's their five. Wait, I'm sorry, say it again? They went Stevenson, Rambo, Johnson, Arroyo, Kinchins. Okay, so they added in DeAndre Johnson, and then they had the tight end instead yeah. of the return guy that I picked. Okay, okay. Um, you know the three grad transfers uh, or the transfer portal guys. Um, that makes sense. And again, I kind of talked myself out of Johnson, but putting him in there is completely within the realm of possibilities, and I'm not going to fight you on that. I, I get it. He played at Tennessee for years. I think he's going to start for us. I think he's going to be really good. Uh, so there's that. Um, Arroyo, um, I just think that Will Mallory is going to have a really, really strong season. And I know that we're still going to go to the two tight end thing, and you're going to see some Arroyo out there uh, and everything. And Kitchens was just too good in the uh, in the spring uh, for a newcomer. Now, you could do the 
the Blake Griffin, Joel Embiid, you know, red shirted their first year and won uh, rookie of the year their first year in the NBA, but they had not played the previous year. If you wanted that, you can go Avante Williams easily because he didn't even practice really last year. You know what I mean? Well, he did practice. Let, let me not be hyperbolic in that kind of a way. Uh, but, you know, I'm just saying he was not on the field in games or anything. Um, so you could easily go there um, with Avante Williams. You could easily just go to the five stars and say, I believe that James Williams – and Leonard Taylor are going to earn their way on the field. And even if they don't earn it, maybe we need to skip them ahead of some guys because they have higher potential. I could easily see you going there with that um, and everything. But, um, yeah, no, that's a that's a solid list, actually, for Mathlon. That's a solid list. I would like to see it just five, five guys who didn't play at Miami last year. So even if you have, a, like, a redshirt freshman or a second-year true freshman like Avante, but take out the transfers because – you're bringing in transfer portal guys, grad transfer guys, ostensibly to be star players. So we already know that and everything. But if you're going with other guys, new guys onto the field, into the rotation or, or whatever, um, hell, I'll just answer my own question then. Um, you got the two five stars, Williams and Taylor. Um, I'm going to stick with Kinchins. I'm going to stick with um, Borgales. And I'm going to stick with uh, Curtis. So, um, you know, I, for me, it's just subbing two out. Uh, for the other list, it would be subbing three out because they had all three of the grad transfers up there. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I would like to see something like that. But hopefully, again, uh, we play the we play the best players and some of these younger guys earn their way onto the field because I think that that would be beneficial in the short and long term for the Miami Hurricanes. Came Underwood, State of the U. Check out uh, his work and the rest of the staff there at uh, SB Nation at stateoftheu.com. I'm sure most of you are familiar, if not all. And if you're not, head on over there. Get yourself prepped for football season. Of course, baseball is going on right now. Stateoftheu.com. We're here uh, typically on Thursday night uh, because I've got some plans and things going on with family later this week. We switched to Tuesday night, so I appreciate Cam obliging me in that so we're here and that's one of the big reasons why you subscribe hit that bell for the notifications that way you know when we're going live all right i'm going to bring up one guy in particular and by the way ocali kane i went back as far back as i could in the live chat didn't see your question so just repost it please so because this program this team has produced three at least on the collegiate level and now we'll see onto the nfl elite pass rushing defensive ends in Phillips Roche and Russo over the last two seasons. How important is DeAndre Johnson and who else could be a super force of the 10 to 12 sack variety? I mean, Johnson, uh, he raises the floor at defensive end, I think, um, because he's a proven performer. No, he's not a, you know, 25 sack guy coming over, but uh, he has size and skill and experience at the, you know, highest level. Um, arguably hot top competition, we'll call it. Um, so uh, he has that. So yeah, he raises the floor. I think at defensive end, um, Zach McLeod is going to have some snaps at defensive end, but I don't really see him as a game changer. I think him as a guy who, you know, can eat two hundred and fifty snaps, three hundred snaps over the course of a season and not be terrible uh, with his assignments. I think if you're looking for a breakout kind of a guy at defensive end. You're looking at Jafari Har sorry, Jafar I Harvey. You're looking at Cameron Williams. You're looking at Chance Williams. No relation between those two. Uh, you're maybe looking at um, I would say between those three, it's probably we're gonna look for a guy who can start to uh, because they have the physicality and athleticism to put those traits together to become, you know, productive players on the field. I would say you would start there with where you're going to look for uh, impact pass rushers down the line of Jabari Ishmael uh, and, and things like that. But I would say uh, between Williams, Williams, and Harvey, those would be the guys you're really looking at to take that next step to fill in uh, for your, uh, you know, your Gregory, I'm sorry, your Jonathan Garvins and second team all ACC, looking at your uh, Russo, Phillips, Roche kind of thing, yeah. UM Kane, appreciate uh, the Super Chat contribution. Thank you so much for that. Uh, everybody keep in mind that the uh, Super Chat is available. Cam gives of his time. We're here producing college football content every day. 
and uh, also Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App. And if you're giving, contributing specifically for this show, just uh, put Miami or Cam on there, and uh, we will take care of it. All right, UMK, are we the only program to produce three straight first or second team All-Americans with Willis in 18, Russo in 19, Phillips in 20, go Canes. Well, we would have to go into the encyclopedia, but I'm guessing no. We're talking about one position, obviously, here. Well, technically, right. you're talking two because Willis played tackle and Russo and Phillips played end. Yeah. So, I, I mean, off the top of my head, no, because you have Clemson had, like, their whole defensive line, first-round draft picks. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And they were there for multiple years. You obviously have guys all the time in Alabama uh, and things like that. So off the top of my head, not having done the research, my gut tells me no. I don't um, think so. The, the, the best players aren't always all Americans. Right. You know how that worked. But, uh, yeah, like you say, Alabama's churning them out at those two positions, of course, and every other position. Clemson's line in 2018 was one of the greatest of all time. Ohio State's had two Boses and a Chase Young in the last five I mean, years. Hello. <laughs> like, it might not have been three consecutive, but, you know, three out of five or three out of four ain't bad. You know what I mean? Uh, when you're talking Bosa, Bosa, and Young. Uh, although, still, I openly hate that school, but I cannot – I mean, like, I cannot controvert what they did on the field, regardless of my feelings about that institution. Like, come on, bro. Like, come on. So, um, again, off the top of my head, no. But um, it's a damn good calling card to say, hey, we've had an All-American defensive tackle, two defensive ends. You know, you know, we had two defensive ends, both of those guys, picking the first round this last, you know, NFL draft. Uh, first time since 2006 when Manny Diaz was at uh, NC State. And they had Mario Williams and Manny Lawson both in the first round. So, like, the proof is in the pudding. Whether you're talking about accolades at this level, whether you're talking about draft capital, which means guaranteed contracts at the next level with big signing bonuses of eight figures. You know what I mean? Like, well, probably seven figures for Russo because he slid a little bit. But, I mean, eight figures definitely for uh, for uh, Phillips. Upfront cash, like, you sign your name. And, like, I imagine what that feels like because back in the day, way back when, I first started teaching. We got a $500 signing bonus. And I remember when I first signed my contract, they're like, cool, here's a cashier's check for $500. And I felt like I was floating on air. Bro, if I had $12 million for signing my name on a con, what? What? So if you're looking at that, and I mean, look, if you're a football player, obviously you want to go pro in, in sports. You want to go there and get that. Now, we've proven here. And with the coach in two different spaces within 15 years, that not even just you, but you and one of your homeboys on the same team can both attain this goal. So I don't know that that is accurate, that we're the only team who's done something like that, UM Kane, but that could be part of, it should be part of the recruiting pitch. Again, spinning this back to talent acquisition and roster building and recruiting, we got all these high level elite defensive ends. Bro, I'm saying that. Willis, Roche, I'm sorry, Russo, and Phillips, all Americans, all ACC, first round draft picks, got this, got that, John Garvin still on a roster in Green Bay, this guy's over here, this guy's doing that, let the next one be you, and we can continue this, and now the next time in three or four years, I'm sitting in somebody else's living room, I'm talking about you as the foundation for this is a success story, the next success story for someone who came in, was an All-American, a first-round draft pick, and went to the league, and now we're going to get the next guy to follow behind, just like we're getting you to follow behind this guy. And yes, Cameron Williams does need to put on weight, but I think that he can and still be productive at the size he is and then, you know, has the summer to continue to lift as well. Just in the last few days, I've had investment slash money conversations with my kids and, um, you know, about putting money in its proper place and having the right perspective and relationships. People are more important. It is important, of course, money and saving, investing, all that stuff. But anyway, when you talk about $12 million like that, you're talking about basically unless you're a knucklehead and it's happened a million times out there where people have blown fortunes, but putting that aside for any reasonable person who either has the know-how or will place their trust in somebody who has the know-how, basically what you've determined right there is that you 
are set for life. You can now choose to do whatever you want. You can then say, I no longer want to follow this, this employment line that I've been on and work at this particular place. I can do whatever I want. Basically, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just whatever you want. And yeah, I know your agent's going to get a percentage and your manager and your financial advisor, and you're going to, you know, get a house for your mom or, or give her enough money, you know, slice her off a million of that, whatever's left. So she doesn't have to work again. And obviously, you know, uh, good old uncle Sam is going to get his good share of that as well. Uh, and everything. But I mean, yeah, you want to have, I would rather be in position to have you take taxes out of my $12 million than work the secret day job at the love. And look, I make decent money. I'm not making anybody's, you know, baller money. I'm not, you know, like on air talent, ESPN money or anything, but I make decent money. But like, I would rather have the problem, the great problem of you taking taxes out of my $12 million check. What are you talking? Like, come on, bro. But again, you can still leverage that hopefully to then say, if you want to get paid and you want to go to the league and you want to set yourself up financially for a lifetime, come to Miami because we have put guys in the first round and set them up to do things like that and to be those kind of successes. And then if you work that money, that's money that can continue to work for you. I know that y'all probably might not know the name, but Mel Gray was a all pro return man for the Detroit Lions. Mel Gray owned seven Ford dealerships in the Detroit area when I was growing up. So, like, that money, everybody, I mean, look, and I'm from Motor City, USA. Like, come on, bro. People are still buying cars, even today. That money is still working for them. So you can even, look, you can be a baller. You can splash some of it. You can get change. You can get the watches. You can get the rolls. You can do all those things. But you can also have that money work for you for a lifetime. But only if you come to the University of Miami and work with us and grow with us and do all of these things, become a first team All-American, you're going to get your contract. And again, in four years from now, I'm going to talk to your little brother, your cousin, or the next great player from St. Thomas, Miami, Killian, Columbus, wherever. Booker T, Central, the West. I'm not naming every school in South Florida because I know y'all going to say, you ain't name my school, whatever. But I'm getting you now. We're going to set you on that path. You're going to have that success. And then I'm going to get the next guy next year, the year after, the year after. So we can continue to build like that. That's how I think you can leverage those things from that question appropriately. Jafar, appreciate you asking. So uh, whether it's Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, they're all at Mark Rogers TV. I know Cash App has a little dollar sign, then Mark Rogers TV. So the same thing, the dollar sign and Mark Rogers TV. So we've had people ask about uh, forecasting the Clemson Georgia game and the Florida State Notre Dame game. For me, those are so far off, and this is a Miami show. And I'll just give you my two cents real quick. These are not final predictions because I make those the week of the game. But uh, Georgia Clemson, I think, is a phenomenal matchup. Again, as I mentioned to Cam earlier, I think those two teams will put the most talent on one field during the regular season this year, but Georgia has lost a ton. They lost three cornerbacks, just cornerbacks in the NFL draft, Tyreek Stevenson to Miami. Uh, so they are hurting in the secondary right now and facing uh, Justin Ross and company may not be um, the, the, the right tonic in week one, but uh, Clemson's typically had uh, the, the one slight weakness would be offensive line play. They couldn't block too well against the elite teams last year, so they might have issues there. I think it's going to be a phenomenal matchup. Notre Dame, Florida State, that's a different deal. Notre Dame's on a different level. Uh, they they should beat Florida State by three touchdowns. Agreed. Then someone else had asked about Miami's trajectory toward a playoff spot, how long that will take. And before you jump on this, Cam, with the educated response, I'll just say, like with any program that's not there right now, it could take forever if they don't do take the right steps and do the right things. What could it take reasonably? Well, they're one of the top 15 teams in the country. Now, those last few steps to get to the top three or four are pretty substantial. But I, I think, um, again, I, I will 
answer it in a sense and almost segue it into Cam's response by asking Cam you a question to outline because you know the recruiting process and also what the metrics mean the difference between being really Alabama and Ohio State and Georgia are the three that constantly get right. those top three or four spots versus being like um, and I think of Florida in particular because I was having this conversation the other day and Florida was involved where they're recruiting well a lot of talented guys but it's more like it's been nine 12, nine, the last three years. Yeah. What What's that difference? And if you don't make up that gap, unless you can get the generational quarterback or really just have a team that gets on a roll, you're probably not good enough. Yeah, um, it's more better, bigger guys. You know, um, so less, less developmental, kind of less Gregory Russo's, and more Jalen Phillipses. And I know that they're both first round draft picks. I know they were both all. Does everybody still see me and hear me? Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Um, sorry. So no worries. Um, so my answer was more J uh, more Jalen Phillipses and less Gregory Russo's, fewer, I should say. Um, and I know they were both All-Americans and both first-round draft picks, but Gregory Russo had this developmental path where he changed his body and he – the performance met the potential. So we bridged that gap and he got there. Jalen Phillips, he was himself, really. And I know that there was the interstitial of, you know, leaving US, uh, UCLA and losing the weight and going into music and coming back. And I know there was all that, but he was the number one recruit in America. Right. And he ended up living up to that ilk when he finally hit the field and he finally, you know, got through. But more of those guys is really what you need. Um, and I mean, even bigger er guys, you know what I mean? Offensive linemen, defensive tackles. Like, I know that we pay that short shrift a little bit because, you know, speed and skill and everything, but you've got to have big dudes up front. You've got to have good big guys and lots of them. You know, you really want to be about too deep offensive and defensive line, blue chips, big guys who will move people. Right. Um, nice. Uh, to For Miami, the thing is, keeping and elevating the level of recruiting, um, balancing the roster, because I think the, the roster is a little imbalanced. Like you don't really have great linebackers. You really have not great cornerbacks at the moment. Maybe a couple of mango seasons, a couple of years down the road, you might have those, but you don't have them right now. So there's always going to be strengths and weaknesses, but I think that those positions are really deficient at this point. So you really need to raise that level. So it needs to have, you know, the, the floor of a position on the team needs to be raised. So it's not as glaring a difference between the ceiling, like the safeties or the running backs or something like that. Um, and you need to have a generational quarterback, whether it's generational for a season or like more. You know what I mean? If generational for one season would be Joe Burrow. Generational for a career would be Trevor Lawrence. You know what I mean? But you need – not just a good quarterback, not just even though I think that he's probably the second best quarterback since Ken Dorsey or the best quarterback since Ken Dorsey. I not a Brock Berlin, not a Brad Kaya. I need a clear level above those guys. And those guys are really good. And Brad Kaya is the career leading passer. So please don't clip this and say that I was talking shit about him because I'm not. And I've met Brad and I know Brad and don't do that. But I think we've seen from the performance on the field that you need a quarterback, a generational talent, one that's just a little that that different level. And you have to have that as part of the package with this increased, improved, bigger, faster roster. Because I just think that you need to have that. You know, and when Clemson won, they had very good defensive line. 
They had all kinds of big dudes who got drafted highly in the NFL. They had all kinds of offensive line, even though their best offensive linemen maybe got drafted a little bit lower and maybe changed position in the NFL, like a Jackson Carmen, who was the number one tackle coming out of the state of Ohio, going down to Clemson, playing left tackle, getting drafted and kicking inside the guard after, you know, everything that he did. So you think, well, he wasn't that good. He was that good at this level. And still, I'm good enough and big enough where I'm going to be taken with a high pick, but then I'm going to be moved to a different position on the offensive line that they think fits my skill set a little bit better because I got a bigger, more athletic dude playing next to me at tackle. And that's okay. But you have to have those kind of things. And you cannot miss your opportunities, whether that's coaching, whether that's injuries, whether that's whatever. You cannot miss your opportunity. So if somebody unlikely gets injured, Derek King. That could close your window. You don't go for it on a fourth and medium in a game. That could close your window. So you have to be bold and you have to hit those shots and improve this roster, grow this roster, get this roster faster, and have a generational quarterback. So those are the things that I think I see as needing to change to get Miami to a playoff spot. When? It could be in a couple of years. It could be in 20 years. You know, I think that that comes down to what you think. First and foremost, I think that will, that comes down to who you think is going to win the quarterback battle between the uh, Tyler Van Dyke and Jake Garcia and which one you think could be generational. While I am a Tyler Van Dyke fan, I think from what I've seen, the one who has the potential to be generational is Jake Garcia. That's just me, myself, personally. Agree or disagree as you like. In this hypothetical, though, if I'm thinking that Jake Garcia can be generational, you're thinking when in his timeline could this happen? As a junior, sophomore, you know, three years on from now. So 2024, 2025 as a senior or fourth year player in this program. It could be, it could potentially possibly be that it could be longer if neither one of those guys is more generational than solid to good. You know what I mean? Um, So there are some hurdles to be had uh, to be to hurdles to be leaked and distance to cover between where we are and where we want to be in terms of getting to a playoff spot. I think that there are some schedules in the, future that could be advantageous before uh, for that pursuit. I don't think it's going to happen. But you start off with a win against Alabama and I mean that's this season all of a, all of a sudden becomes playoff spot possible. Again, I don't think it's going to happen, but it could. And if it did, then you would say, okay, this season, no, we're all in. We got to do whatever we got to do. So since there have been so few teams that have actually made the playoff and Miami's only made the ACC championship game one time and have never won it because I know that y'all have already said that in the FSU trash talking section of this show. I would put it reasonably four years three years at the earliest with this class of 2021 as retro sophomores or juniors, because those, all these big dudes, this highly ranked class, all of a sudden, you know, and then last year's class, they're seniors in front of them. Right. So those last two classes, 20 and 21 are now juniors and seniors with again, in my view, and it could be the other way, but ostensibly a Jake Garcia as a third year player, second year starter, becoming the generational player that, you know, I think he has potential to become and things like that. That would be the absolute fastest. I think it would be possible. I think more realistic if it's going to happen. Actually, if it's going to happen, I would say it would be between that three to six years or like 15 to 20. Because I think that we're coming up on a window with the recruiting talent, with the quarterback possibly on the roster and things like that. If it's not going to be soon, then it's going to not be for a little bit.
That's fair. Falcon or Falconer X. I can never keep that straight. <laughs> Miami players excel in the NFL like no other team. Thank you so much for the super chat contribution. Yeah, I mean, Miami, Miami alums, you know, Pro Canes, they do well in, you know, I mean, I was going to say invariably, but there's a couple variables in there. I'm not going to name names, but, you know, there's a couple guys who have not been necessarily great. Um, sure. I mean, that's going to happen, but. It's with I everybody. Mean, right, right, exactly. Every team. But, I mean, you have, I would say you have way more hits and way fewer busts than other teams, including current Alabama. And I'm not saying that we're a better program at this level. I'm not saying that we have more draft picks at a high, excuse me, high caliber than they do because those things I think are verifiably false. But I don't think that every Alabama or the there's not the same percentage of Alabama players who live up to their draft draft capital or draft slot as Miami players who live up to and or exceed with many more going into the NFL Hall of Fame in the near future. That's fair. Kim Underwood, State of the U. Check out his work and the rest of the staff. Anything to highlight there? Uh, we got a piece comparing the 2021 class to former Hurricanes players. Uh, that's my our, our monthly piece by my boy JP. Uh, editing that now. That's going to go up tomorrow. I uh, have a couple other things I love that where he scours the college football landscape for schematic things on offense that he'd say, look, I would steal that, like take that and put that in Miami's playbook. And I think that could be uh, advantageous uh, from a schematic standpoint. I love those. There's been two of those so far. Uh, probably going to thread those together throughout the summer uh, as we go and do those things. Uh, there's some baseball coverage. Uh, I think there's a baseball game going on right now. I don't know what the score is because it's in a different tab. Um, but there's that. And then, uh, yeah, finally, you know, uh, got to get back in there and start talking about recruiting because we're a mere two weeks away from recruiting opening back up. Uh, and the floodgates are going to open because teams already all over the country have these cookouts and these visit days, and these official visits on the calendar and everything. It's going to be, whoa, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. And I can't wait. I can't wait. I love it. I'm excited about it. Uh, so there's that and more, um, you know, getting back into the, uh, the habit of posting more personally and then just also as a group. So uh, check us out at stateoftheu.com, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at the State of the U. My personal Twitter account is at Underwood Sports. I believe I have some below deck Mediterranean, or sorry, below deck sailing yard uh, to tweet about. And uh, hopefully my DVR does not do me dirty and uh, skip the recording of Top Chef like they did last week. Um, I didn't put up the, to the Top Chef power rankings after last week's episode, I don't think. So I gotta go back and do that. So I talk about reality TV and sports and life and everything over there as well. All right. Hit the bell for the notifications to know when we go live. And uh, as I've said many times here recently, you enjoy the live streams, other people as well. So bring in uh, more people. And if you joined us, as is typically the case, we got more people on here right now than we have the entire hour. So wait for the video to post. You'll be all set. And uh, you can watch it in just a few minutes. And then again, notifications get you here on time all right Cam, appreciate it so much hey mark it's been fun you know enjoy uh the weekend and everything we'll catch up next week nebraska at eight o'clock eastern time on the nebraska channel we'll see you then